Can you hear me now? Smell of it. Can we hear you? You're muted. I need to self and introduce yourself. And we don't you. You, are, you can't participate. Okay. Hey. Oh, hello? Yep. Hello. hello. I, can, I can hear you. My name is Timo Mina. I'm architect for Zenz. Okay. What about uh, Honan? Yes, I'm here. I can hear you. And, oh, and introduce yourself to the audience tonight. Sure. I'm Puna Ramgopal, and I'm one of uh, Supervisor Smith's staff aides. Okay. So we have representatives of the Sully Supervisor, Kathy Smith, who will be our featured speaker in June when she does the state of Sully. This week, it's the report from Rich this month. It's the report from Richmond. We try to keep those letters together. A good thing we're in Sully. Otherwise, I have to figure another name. All right. So, same as Sully. Jim Hart, introduce yourself. He used to be an at large planning commissioner. He's now a member of the Board of Zoning Appeals. He lives in Virginia, right? And we still haven't heard from Madeline. Hi. Madeline? Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. And who are you? Hi, I am an associate at Cosmo O'Connor. So you're here to support I know Evan. Okay, so you're here as to support Evan. That's great. Uh, we heard from somebody, Donna Jackson. Explain what FACA stands for. Donna Jacobson, Lafayette Village Community Association. Okay, Donna, is Lafayette Village Community Association a member of the Silly District? No, it is not. I'm in Mason District. Ah, okay, she's in Mason District. So we, we have broad. Well, you, we take your 10 bucks anyway. All right, never mind. Okay. Uh, all right, so. Jeff, sorry to interrupt. Emma um, is trying to get in, and a couple people said they're trying to get into the meeting, but they have to be let in. Do you see that on the screen? And others did. Let me see how I can let people in. Okay, live. thank you. Okay. Uh, I don't know how to let people in. I don't know what they uh, I mean, you folks got in without a problem. I didn't let you in. Okay, I'll resend her a link. Maybe she used the wrong one. Yeah, send her the link that you used if you have okay. that. Okay. You should just fall in like everybody else has done. Okay, thanks. Okay, all right. So, Steve, introduce yourself. Uh, Steve and George on North Western Fairbanks and the Citizens Association. Your HOA? And uh, yeah, the Jeep Chase. Okay, so you see what I'm saying? People can't be here, they can be there. Such. All right, so the first order of business, according to our shared agenda, Stop that. Thank you. So, sorry. Right, here's the agenda. All right. So, let me go over the agenda. We all, and this agenda link is always the same. We just, if you have the link, you always have the link. Okay. We have a Twitter, a Twitter account, Sully District. We have a Facebook account. We have a YouTube account where our meeting, previous meeting videos are posted. And here's an example. All right. We also have a matrix where we have the past actions of the Solar District Council. And let me go back here. All right. So this is the wrong one. So let me go far. Okay. Here we go. So this month, the first item of business is the Chantilly Premier Post Data Center Alternately, a warehouse of property. We have an automated form that we ask proponents to fill out. And let me see if I can make this a whole page page. No. Uh, oh, no, not this. Okay, so in any case, this is what Evan gave us. It's the proposed data center alternative warehouse zoning approval for owner dealership was approved of the property on July 28, 2020. And it describes where it's located and it's exempt from the requirement to reinstate it. And so we have this document. And 
From that document, we have okay. So Evan provided us a slideshow, which I'm going to open up and then let you go through. And so here is Again, all these artifacts are available through our page. Anybody who wants to, they're always there available. So let's hold on and it'll open up. Okay, so I'm going to turn on the back lights so maybe the people won't be able to see. Don't hold it this way. Okay. You can still see this? Okay, make sure that you sign in, please. If you're coming in now, please sign in. You can see that the uh, government center has really high Wi-Fi speeds. We won't go. It's free, so anything that happens is all right. There we go. Okay, so <laughs> I'm going to turn it this way. And I'm going to do this way. So if you stand, oh, you can stand where you are. And I'm going to turn it this way. There we go. That would be very helpful. Okay, and I'm going to turn it this way. So let me see if we can get Evan's picture. And uh, Evan. Okay, there you go. My good side, Jeff. Your good side, Paul. I'm sorry, I didn't ask you to do 100 days. Okay, there you go. All right, so here you go. And you can just, you know, how that works. Okay, yeah, great. So we're going to let Evan give this presentation. All right. Hi, everybody. As, as Jeff just said, my name is Evan Pritchard. Uh, I'm the land use uh, attorney for the applicant. I'm at a law firm uh, called Posen O'Connor. I've been, in, uh, been here many times before, uh, sometimes with different law firms. But uh, thanks for your interest tonight. One thing I want to say at the outset is that unless Jeff disagrees, um, in my experience, we typically, as an applicant on a big case like this, come to this forum, this, this meeting two times. Um, tonight's meeting, as I understand it, and as it typically runs, is uh, an introductory meeting for you guys to hear from the applicant, like what this is all about, what we're proposing, what we aren't. Um, I've given Ms. Shang my, my business card because we very much want this to be an ongoing dialogue. We're not trying to um, you know, do this under cover of darkness in any way. We are... Um, and again, unless Jeff disagrees or the, the Sully Joint District doesn't want us back, we would normally come a second time. And when we come back a second time, um, any questions that we don't answer tonight or don't have answers for you tonight, we'll try to have next time. And in looking at the, the, the list of questions that um, Cynthia provided to me beforehand, I can tell you some of them are questions that we may not be able to answer even when we come back, just because they're they're kind of in the weedy, you know, detailed construction level questions that you know may may just have to come further along in the process. So I'll just go through this presentation, and at the end, I'll do my best to answer uh, any questions you have. Um, if I can't answer the question, um, and it's really a uh, uh, you know, business type, logistical type question. Um, I may throw it to my client, Josh Bowden, who's here representing the um, the, the applicant. Uh, and then also uh, we have Jamie Cox, who's with Kimley Horn. He's our civil engineer, um, who I'll throw questions to if they're if they're really technical, you know, civil engineering impact type questions that I can't really answer. So. And we also have TMO on the phone, who is our architect for the base building. Who can build probably answer more building specific questions because he's designed a bunch of these. He is calling in from California. That's why he's not here, but he is listening in. And you can of course use him too. Yeah, and, and just in case uh, folks at home didn't hear that, that was Josh pointing out that um, our our architect for the data center option um, is on the phone from California, so he can answer any kind of building uh, specific questions. Before so, you continue on, sure. I know you're waiting for questions and answers, but what is, what, are, what is the data center? What's the warehouse? What's the warehouse going to be? So, so well, let him make the presentation first. Let the well, then I can understand better while he's talking if I know what the difference is. So, so just, 
The, the, the picture on the screen is the data center uh, rendering that we've had prepared. Um, I'll, in the presentation, I'll go through that. That's our option one. That's our preferred, most likely option. We are in our development plans. We are presenting an option two. That is a warehouse option. That if a where if a data center deal falls apart, we can't find any takers for it. Um, we would we would be looking towards the the warehouse option. They're mutually exclusive. It'll okay. be one or the other. So. Um, the site that we have today, uh, the reason we're here today is we filed a rezoning application uh, on the 12.1 acre portion of this larger site that was, that as Jeff mentioned, was previously approved in 2020 for an auto dealership. Um, we're part of the site today is, is zoned uh, C8. That's a commercial, a heavy, heavy duty commercial district. That was for the uh, car dealership. The other portion of the property, I-5, uh, was is, is already zoned I-5. That was for the service center part of that approval. Um, what we're going to do, what we're proposing to do is rezone the C-8 portion to I-5. That's an industrial district, as I'm sure many, if not all of you know, that does allow for uh, data center uses. Um, we are also under the first option, the option one data center, um, option, we are requesting special exceptions to allow for more than 70 feet height up to 110 feet, including the rooftop mechanical equipment and a special exception for increased density that would allow us to go up to a, a 0.8 FAR instead of a 0.5 FAR. So I'll explain what that means in, in some slides coming up. So just to back up, like I said, it's part of a larger site. That is 79 acres uh, shown on the screen. That's the large portion outlined in green. The blue portion, it's kind of hard to see, but is up in the upper right corner. That's the 12.1 acres of that 79 acres. And uh, that's that's where we're talking about getting approvals to build anything. It's, it's within those, those blue lines. Um, the green portion, that's 67 acres. That's in what's called the resource protection area, the RPA. No development. We're not proposing any development in there. Fairfax County, by and large, doesn't allow any development in there. So that 67 acres is going to um, remain untouched. Um, we did measure the distance between that blue area and the closest, uh, you know, the closest edge of the Pleasant Valley neighborhood at right around 0.45 miles. Um, so when we say in various parts of the application, we're not close to residential, we don't mean there's not any residential anywhere nearby. We just mean we're not abutting, you know, directly abutting any, any residential uses. And then you can see that indicated right here. I'm showing this slide. I, I know it's impossible for you guys to see out there, um, but this is just to provide the context of the site. In this in this slide uh, that Jamie put together, the 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 sort of white whitish area is the site we're proposing to build on, and then you might notice it bulges out a little bit more on the on the left side. That is to also account for the the stormwater outfall, like the you know the stormwater that is uh, going to run into the uh, that includes the stormwater facilities that we're putting in the sort of prevent stormwater from running into cup, uh, cup run. So it, it looks a little bit larger. Um, there's already some, some I-5 zone properties in the Inter Enterprise uh, Industrial Park uh, to the north of your neighborhood, shown on the left-hand side of the screen, as well as um, this big square building that you see over here that's over in the auto park, uh, auto park circle um, complex of all those car dealerships. Uh, that are that are sort of located to the east and uh, run along Stonecrop. Um, so that that just provides a little bit of uh, of context. And then, of course, you can see the Pleasant Valley neighborhood um, is located in the lower left hand uh, side of the screen. Question for you: Are you going to be building over any of the existing uh, auto dealership space? So we're not. Uh, the question was: Are we building over any of the um, auto dealership ship space? We're not building in any of the auto park circle properties to the east of us. We are we are asking for approval to build 
either the data center or the warehouse mm -hmm. right. on the on the ground where the the current car dealership is approved but unbuilt. So that's, that's the gray area. area. That's and the gray area. area. Correct. So while he's doing that, um, you, um, why do you need um, the rezoning to the I five? What would prevent it from being an I three and um, not be and have the perhaps the right to environmentally understand the impact of that of this move. So, so we the, the question was why are we zoning to I five uh, the as opposed to like I four I three. Uh, the, the all all three of those districts do allow data centers. The the I five does allow for greater height and um, and intensity. And uh, one point I want to make very clear is. We are proposing a big, a big for the site, a big data center. Um, it's not big by some of the standards of some that have been built in the area recently. It is on the bigger side because that is what we're hearing in the marketplace is is in demand. We're proposing 402,000 square feet. That doesn't mean that's what's actually going to be built. Um, I told Josh when we first started on this project that he he knows it too. That's kind of the, the biggest we think anybody could possibly want. Um, there is a decent sized chance that what actually gets built is is smaller than that. So but I I don't understand why the building right, the right to build on the remaining 67 acres is to be rezoned. Why why does that have to be I5? So we're we're not re I'm sorry, so we're not I understand your question now. So the 67 acres, the larger piece of this parcel is already zoned I3. It just just as a legacy zoning. And, and we're not asking that anything be changed. Again, nothing is being built or proposed in the 67 acres. So the the the, the piece of property we're asking to be zoned um, in this case, it's just the, the CA portion, the upper portion of the property. Um, that that's part of that 12.1 acres. That's the the change in zoning we're asking for. The 67 acres, the zoning category is not is not changing for that. It's all one property. It's not subdivided. At some point, it'll be subdivided. The 12.1 acres will be one property. There'll be a subdivision where the remaining 67 acres will be its own property, and he'll get into later what we intend to do with the remaining 67 acres, which I think everybody would be interested to hear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll just I'll, I'll just go through a few more slides and some of these questions may make uh, some of this may reveal itself a little bit better as we go through. So, as I, as I've been saying, uh, this is a, this is a, a snippet of the generalized development plan that was approved in 2020 uh, for this car dealership. Um, so, so that approval remains in place. If someone wanted to, if there was a demand for it, you know, we could start applying. Uh, for site plan approvals and building permits to build a, a car dealership there. As you all know, uh, since between 2020 and now, the world has changed quite a bit. Um, you know, the, the supply, their supply chain issues. Oh, now I'm hearing myself. That's what we've done. There are, uh, you know, supply chain issues. There are, you know, market, market factors, all of which have made it, um, you know that that car that car dealership hasn't obviously been built uh, to date. There is strong demand, as as you're all aware, uh, for data centers. Most of us are shopping on Amazon and and doing everything online, and so um, that that demand is there. But if if the demand ever comes back for a car dealership, if this project goes nowhere to build a data center or a warehouse, um, we would fall back on the car dealership route. It was approved in July of 2020, just in time for the pandemic to get really in full swing. Um, one thing I want to note, because I know there's been a lot of concern in the community that's been voiced about impacts on Cub Run, impacts on the RPA. Um, a lot of the impacts on RPA result from the amount of impervious ground cover, and 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 as you may know, that's the the asphalt, the concrete that the rainwater can't soak down through, and so it, it comes runoff, storm runoff. Um, of the car dealership approval, 8.19 of that 12.1 acres was approved as impervious surface. 
because as you know, car dealership has a lot of cars and a lot of asphalt parking areas. The majority of that site there shown there, two, two thirds of it um, was, was, is, is, is approved on the plans as impervious uh, area. 15% of the 12.1 12, acres was gonna be provided as what the county calls open space. That means landscaped green areas where the water, you know, where rainwater can soak into the ground. Um, the build, the service center was the taller of those. They, it was two pieces. It was gonna be your traditional car dealership showroom building. That was, that was approved to be about 40 feet. The auto service center to the south on the southern part of that was going to go up to 60 feet and to serve the whole site um, they were going to have 800 and 817 parking spaces and four loading spaces so that was that's what we're starting with that was what was approved in 2020 what we're proposing again as our preferred option we're calling it option one we're proposing a data center um, this this would you know, from the from the jump, have a much better impact from a from an RPA environmental standpoint, for the simple reason that instead of 8.19 acres being impervious, 6.46 uh, would would be impervious. So that's about a 21 percent reduction. Um, it is it is a large building. Again, we're proposing point point eight FAR. That's 400 and FAR is floor to area ratio. So that is the size of the building divided by the size of the 12.1 the acres, and that gives you a 0.8. So uh, we're proposing a 402,000 square foot data center. Again, that is sized to be as on the far end of the big, you know, the big side of the spectrum that we think could like feasibly somebody would want to build. We don't know if that will actually be the size. That's as big as it's gonna get. Um, of the 12.1 acres, 46% is being set aside as open space. So again, that's gonna be landscaped areas, tree save areas, green areas. It's gonna be the area you can see in the blue, there's going to be, uh, that's a stormwater catchment basin. Um, it probably, Jamie, correct me if I'm wrong, probably won't be like a, a, a wet stormwater catchment basin that has water in it most of the yeah. time. It'll be a dry, it will be, it will be. okay, so that, so that so that will be uh, what you're used to seeing a stormwater pond on the on the western side. That's to catch all the rain uh, rainwater. That's to uh, allow it to stay in that pond, slowly seep into the ground, get clean, not rush uh, dirty water into uh, into Cub Run. Um, as I mentioned before, the well, building also acts as a buffer between the building and the actual RPA itself. So it's not like the building's going to be directly on the line where we can build. To you on site. Yeah, the, the, for those who didn't hear, Jamie's pointing out that one one point that staff, um, since we started this process, staff has been very consistent. They not only want us to stay out of the resource protection area, stay out of the RPA, but they've had us stay back as far from it as as we can. So we're only going into the RPA with necessary to to sort of do positive things to like put some trees where there's kind of just sandy dirt right now to, um, you know, to support that pond so that it, it actually works well and, and does its job. Uh, there's, a, there's a place where we're going into the RPA, but we're not putting any kind of building or paving, doing any kind of excavating um, in that RPA area. Um, we're proposing 110 um, feet of height. That does include um, the equipment, including the, the, the chillers that are going to go and other equipment that are going to go on the roof of the data center. Um, we're proposing 50 parking spaces. That's kind of tied to what the uh, county parking requirements are. Same with loading spaces, two loading spaces. And we're proposing uh, to meet at least lead silver, uh, a lead silver rating. I'm sure many of you know that's that's the you know, the uh, most commonly used uh, rating system for how, how green or environmentally friendly a building is. Um, lead silver for a data center is, is, is pretty good. There are higher ratings, but for a data center, lead silver is, uh, is, 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 is pretty solid and, and somewhat difficult to achieve, as I understand it. 
Uh, and then to just give you a further idea, these are some elevate of what the building is going to look like if we build the data center. These are elevations that Timo on the line um, created for us. These, I, I have a note here that these are conceptual drawings only subject to change at site plan because, again, Josh is, is not necessarily going to be the, he's not going to be running the data center or occupying it. Um, it's typical with any kind of rezoning, data center or otherwise in Fairfax County, that you have to give an idea of, of what the building's going to look like. But I'm just, uh, I'm beating a dead horse here, but I'm just trying to say this is generally kind of what, what it would look like. Um, in terms of architectural style. I have a question, sir. Sure. I mean, for myself, to be honest, the only data centers I've seen are like the ones on 50. Can you give us a comparison visually? Like, how big comparison? I mean, most people here may be, everyone's here seen them. So, can you, what, 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 can you compare those visually? Um, I, Side-wise? Jamie, do you, can you give like a ball? So that actually, um, so the AWS one that's nearest to us on 50, uh, that is 70 feet high. It's, un it's under the 75 now. feet. It's under the 75 feet limit that's required in the I-5. That's also an I-5 district. So that's just under the 75. So the 11? Correct. Okay. So that that between Avion Parkway and Stonecroft Road. So so this is going to be about 40 feet higher what? than that. What are the yeah, ones so. in F thirty? Well, how how high are those? You know, I don't have them. I do have I yeah, I do have some slides about the, the visual impacts here that I want to share with you. But this is uh, those are coming up. This these are some renderings uh that, that Timo prepare that, that give you sort of you know some views around the site. I will say that what you're gonna see in the in the upcoming slides is Unless you're in a helicopter or you're front flying a drone around, you're not ever really going to see the building from these angles. It's going to be pretty hard, if not impossible, to see from Route 50. It's it's not going to be visible from your neighborhood. Um, I have to sure. beg to differ on that one. We are 80 feet higher, so you're not really taking the top. We, can... we have taken that. Okay, okay well, then I'd like to. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, so we. We do have an engineer. We are aware of the topography, and, and we have taken that into account. And that slide, and that is a perfect segue to this slide. So this this does take into um, account the change in topography. Um, you're actually the, the the edge of Pleasant Valley is actually a little lower, um, but suffice to say, by the time you bridge the 0.45 miles that that separates you guys, you've got the 67 acres. Um, one thing I failed to point out in the earlier slide is there's some existing Fairfax County parkland that you guys are probably familiar with that's, that already um, abuts the neighborhood. We're obviously not doing anything with that either. Um, but you know, this is this is a slide that that uh, Timo put together. It shows the red line from the the top of the the the, the highest point, the mechanical equipment up at 110 feet. Um, it's such a far distance that we had to. You know, we had to compress the, you know, the view to fit it all on one sheet, but the, the sight line, you know, runs in a, in a straight line across that entire distance. And by the time you get down, um, you know, to the, to the houses in the Pleasant Valley neighborhood, the closest, uh, the, close, the closest house that's in the Pleasant Valley neighborhood, you know, you're not going to be able to see this above the tree line. We have, we have some more slides that will hopefully be helpful. So. The supervisor's office shared with us um, the image on the left. I know this was in a flyer that some of you may have seen um, of what the of what the building might look like. That that would you know that's obviously not our building, but that that is uh, also in that's that's if we were to able to build in the RPA the 67 acres closest to your neighborhood. Again, we're not proposing anything in the RPA. Uh, we don't get anywhere close to there. So we had Timo prepare the exhibit on the right, which again, if you go up in a balloon, you know, if you're a couple hundred feet up in the air, you wouldn't be able to see the data center um, uh, sort of, you know, top of top upper upper half of the screen, kind of in the center there, that kind of bluish uh, silvery area um, is is where our building would be. But again, when you go down to um, the street level, 
we, we've drawn this box here, you know, approximating about where that building would be from the street, from the sidewalk, um, you know, it's, it's just not going to be uh, visible at that, at that distance. It's going to be blocked by the pool. Clarify, you said that it was from the closest home to on that previous two previous slides. Sorry, I should have stopped it. Yep. Um, and, and from the closest home. And so when we go up, Cub run, we raise up about another 60 to 80 feet. Um, so that's not taking that into account. Then oh, you're saying the closest you're saying that the yeah, the, the lowest point is, is the on lowest. the end of the neighborhood. Yes, the, the lowest point is on the end. Of so the so that that is that is an example, Madeline, to take this down. When we when we come back, we'll have an answer for you on that okay, about great. like what what the visual impact, if any, would be on the, the high point. Okay. Uh, and I'll connect with you yes, on like yes. where where we should have that. Thank you. Uh, that point measured. Uh, okay. So, in addition to the visual impacts, the height, the size of the building, I know there's a lot of concern about noise impacts. You all know that um, there were backup generators um, for data centers that operate. You know, just when they're they're needing maintenance or when the power goes out to keep the the servers cool and keep those going. Uh, there's also noise impacts from uh, the cooling system. Um, there's been a lot of concern, and and just while we're on cooling systems, um, we are we are not certain what kind of cooling system we have. More we're going to have more likely than not, it will be some sort of air cooled system that will you consume a lot less lo uh, water. I know water consumption was a concern. Um, you know, we can't. Again, we're not the we're not the data center operator here, so we can't tell you tonight for certain it will be air cooled. But there's a good chance of that. The air coolers um, do generate noise, um, as as you know. We did have uh, this noise study prepared that took into account all the all the noise that's being generated um, at the at the at peak times with like everything going at once, everything turned on full blast. Um, <clears throat> during during this this first slide though is just normal operating conditions. What's what the typical uh, most common noise situation is going to be. According to our noise study, there should be no impact that that gets across the RPA that gets to any part of, of Pleasant Valley. During Maintenance operations, these uh, generators, they do have, as, as I'm sure you all know, or many of you know, the generators, even when there's not a power outage, you do have to turn them on every once in a while. I believe it's like once a month just to exercise them, keep them um, in good operating um, shape. Um, that will generate some, some additional noise. Um, it's difficult to tell. You, you know, if, if you don't, um, Cynthia, get a copy of this presentation from the website that Jeff has already posted, I'll get you a copy of it so you can actually see this. Um, but at that time, the noise contour line that will be within part, you know, the easternmost part of Pleasant Valley will be at about the 50 decibel level. Um, according to this noise level decibel chart that you know, is just available online, you know, that they equate that to about a conversation level. Um, uh, so, so they can run them in their, in their diagnostic. It's, it's in the middle of the day. It's not at 12 o'clock at night and it's not every night. It's basically dirt, like it was, uh, it's called 10 a.m. on a Wednesday. They would do it when people are typically up and at work. It's not hard and big. And I'm sorry, how long do they last? I would have to uh, ask 30 minutes to an hour. So they run one at a time, um, depending on how big the site is, depends on how many generators, and then usually it's one at a time for 30 minutes, so now. Okay. Yes, sir. Does your noise study take into account the lack of uh, coverage uh, in the winter from, from the trees? Uh, yes. When you're saying one at a time, how many good ones are there? Uh, so on a site like this, you're looking at maybe Seven to eight. Uh, it's seven eight hours. So, so eight, but they run it. They run it bi-weekly, and they put the schedule. So it's not eight trade hours of running generators. So, like you would run the first four, the first week, 
effects for the second peak. Yeah, they would, you, Jamie, they would stagger them, so they'd be right. testing yeah. different they're generators. Not, they're not running generators straight for eight hours. Right. Not for one day. I mean, our modern generators, aren't they programmed to do it on its own? They can be scheduled separately? Because the home generator does the same thing, but it's scheduled in a circuit board. I know the end user, they do it a little bit differently, but that's what they would do. Because they predetermine a time that's least disruptive. So they would, I would imagine they would choose the middle of the day, not a work day, not on a Saturday, not at 8 a.m., 5 a.m. So Wednesday at 10 a.m., maybe for an hour. Yes, sir, in the back. And, and the left here. Um, Virginia Department of Environmental, Environmental Quality, BDEC, the permits, the generators, they cannot run outside of the allowable window by the permit that the developer has to use them. They're only allowable in the time that's legally authorized for a set number of maintenance hours outside of an emergency. No. Okay, and uh, I'll add one other thing. So there are, I, um, I, I did not have noise requirements, but Fairfax County has noise requirements, and whoever the end users has the, those noise requirements. So um, all of their testing will be done during the day, and they're not going to run during night, just like the concert has to stop at 10 o'clock at night. They're not allowed to run the generators at night. So. Um, I We've spent most of our time talking about the data center. I know that's probably the more concerning option. That is the, the preferred option. But again, um, this is going to take some time to get through the approval process. Assuming we get uh, uh, an approval from the Board of Supervisors, we then have to go through the site plan process. You know, that can take another, you know, easily take another six months to a year to get through. And, and then you've got uh, construction time. So it could be a while. Uh, before any construction starts, assuming we have this approved. And in that time, it could prove that, you know, the world could change yet again. Um, and, and perhaps a warehouse makes more sense on this site. So we have proposed that as our option two, um, just to go back through the stats like we did for the data center. Um, this would be a smaller building footprint. Um, this, this building, we think the biggest that would likely be, uh, that anybody would likely want to build here would be more on the scale of 150,000 square feet. That equates to a 0.3 FAR. Um, we'd be able to uh, keep 39% of the 12.1 of the acres um, as open space. Um, the height of that building, we think, would be a maximum of 55 feet. Again, meeting the zoning ordinance requirements for how you park a warehouse, that would be 150 parking spaces we'd need to provide. Uh, 30 loading spaces since it is a warehouse um, and we would shoot for a, a minimum of LEED certified. That's a lower um, environmental rating than the data center, but it's a different it's a different building type. There are fewer moving parts to sort of make make green, if you will. So LEED certified is kind of the industry, um, you know, the, the 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 best you can do with a, a with a warehouse in terms of making it truly green. <clears throat> and like we did with the data center, we uh, had we have a different architect for this option of the project. Uh, he prepared um, some elevations here that, that give you a general sense. It'll it'll look like a, a like a warehouse. Again, these are these are subject to change. These are conceptual only, but they give you uh, a flavor of what that building might look like if we branch. Uh, and again, just um, renderings. Same thing. Um, I'm sure. I'm sure you all know what a, a, a warehouse looks like, but that's that's kind of what we'd be looking at. Um, I mentioned earlier about putting aside the visibility from uh, Pleasant Valley for those of you who are from the the neighborhood. In terms of like driving along, walking along, or if anybody walks along 50 uh, ever. Uh, there is a, a, a large stand of trees we're, we're not going to touch on the property. Um, we're, we've, we've designated that area as a, as a tree preservation area on our plans. So the plan is to keep as many trees um, in that area as possible so that, you know, the, whether it's a data center, whether it's a warehouse, it's going to be as, as, uh, as, if not invisible, as, as invisible as we can make it. Uh, from the roadway, 
Um, here's some, some existing site photos. You may be able at the data center to see the, the, the top of the building over those trees. You probably will be able to not so sure about the, the warehouse. But again, the majority of what you're seeing here is not within our, what we call the limits of disturbance. So it's, it's not going to be where we're, you know, tearing down any trees or, or, or doing any kind of grading or construction work. And then that's just the view from the other side of uh, Route 50. Um, for those of you who have any concerns about the traffic impacts, this is a pretty good story we have to tell. Again, relative to the um, existing approval for a car dealership, um, this slide just, uh, this table here just summarizes what the um, expected uh, car trips or vehicle trips would be with uh, each one of these uses. Um, again, I know you can't really see this, but the, the top number that has the little arrow call out there, that's 398 average daily trips um, that would be coming in and out of the data center if we go with often one. Um, that's a that's a 12, almost 1300 trip reduction from the alley, uh, average daily trips you'd expect from uh, the car dealership as a group. If we were to go with option two and build a warehouse, the estimated number of trips per day uh, would be 695, and that's uh, just under a thousand trips fewer than you'd expect if uh, if a car dealership um, were built on the site. Are we talking like 18 wheelers and stuff though? What that's that? everything. That's people yeah. who work there who come in their car. That's trucks coming in and out, making, picking up deliveries. Most of the traffic would be trucks, big trucks. Uh, uh, probably like 10, 15 percent. Um, but for the data center, I, so the way you calculate the traffic for data centers is so new. Um, but 398 is beyond conservative. Um, ultimately, a lot of these data centers only have 40 to 50 employees a day and about six to eight of them. So you're really only looking at 50 to 60 a day for data centers, um, but just the numbers, what you have to calculate them uh, has not been calculated. So, um, but then in terms of the warehouse option, I would say 10, 15, 20 trucks are going to be uh, warehouses, it would be determined by the end of the whoever's the person who's going to run it and the ultimate warehouse. Yeah, but it could be any time, day or night. It could be any night. Where is the right of way to make an entrance to these buildings? Is That's it going to be on Route 50 or Stonecrawl? So we, we have an agreement with the, uh, the um, auto park circle owners that our preference would be to have it go through off of Stonecrop through those auto oh, Okay. So if you exit out, if you exit out on Route 50, that means there's going to be another traffic light there sooner or later. We got enough of these. You didn't say, say Stonecrop. Right. Said preference, yeah. So, and, and, and the county and VDOT want that as well. They would prefer that we use 50. <laughs> As, as little as possible. Yeah. Okay, but you, I thought in the, the plan, the site plan, um, do the show, development plan, you do show. Yes, we do. We do show entrances. We do show access off of 50. We show. We show. We want for either option. We want access off of 50 and through Auto Park Circle. Um, our preference, and we think our our user preference is going to be to have the majority of that uh, come in through Auto Park Circle off of. Off of Stone Ridge and not coming in off of 50. But but there will be access. There will be access off of 50. There's two access points. And if you go with a warehouse, you typically would take the 18 wheelers to bring it right off of 50 because that's naturally the end of its point. You want to avoid having 18 wheelers traverse as much as possible through Auto Park Circle because that's where everybody's test driving new vehicles and their small vehicles. So we're trying to segregate the two different vehicle types to the extent we can. But when you have a data center use and you have upwards of 25 employees that are using Auto park circle to access their, during their shift. So there's two shifts. That's why there's 50 spots they can swap out without having double park vehicles. Yeah, but if the trucks are going westbound on 50, they can't cut across three lanes. They'll have to put in a light. No, they would. Uh, it would be a right turn out only. So they would. They, they have to come yeah. from the west. Then. So they be turned plus well, they got to make a U turn. Yeah, they would have to go down and. And they can't make a U turn at Pleasant Valley. They got to go all the way. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. In the back. 
it's I don't know if Fairfax Mayor is Loudon, but in Loudon County, all data center sites have to have two entrances and exits for fire apparatus vehicles, fire trucks from the fire marshal's office. They declare that, so I'm not sure if that's what also drives the need for that. It is. It just have to be emergency done. vehicle access. Ultimately, for the data center option, the Route 50 entrance would only be emergency vehicles, and if the auto park circle blocks, they would open the vehicle. But ultimately, it would just be a gate on Route 50 that would be used for emergency vehicles. Yeah. And there's any plans that they'll have Route 50 access period. Not, not with the requirement to have some access. Yes, it's emergency. Well, yeah. Okay, so back to um, the, the the fate of the RPA, you know, 67 acres. Um, we we are discussing with the county, specifically the Fairfax County Park Authority, um, the possibility of of dedicating the land. Uh, to the park authority, uh, Cynthia, I know you had a question about whether there'd be any costs associated with that. We are, are not definitely doing that, but if we do that, that would, we would not get paid for that. That would be just, you know, we would give that to the park authority. They would actually, you would have to pay to remove the basic species. We actually have to spend money to get it to the county. Uh, yeah, so we have to, exactly. They, it, to, that's, that's one of the issues is we would have to potentially remove some bamboo from the site and, and potentially do some cleanup, which wouldn't be that big a deal, except when you're talking about across 67 acres, it adds up pretty quickly. So if we don't dedicate it to Fairfax County Park Authority, we're also exploring working with a local conservation group uh, to, to um, subject the prop to 67 acres to a conservation easement. And again, that would run to the benefit of the conservation group, and it would just it would just say, you know, this land is is would we if, if that if we go that route then the applicant would retain ownership of the property, but it would be in the land, it would be a commitment in the land record saying, we'll never develop the 67 acres. It will only be used as, you know, as it is today for, for trees and, uh, and open space. Regardless of it's on my phone. Right, but if you can't, it's out there. Right. But if you can't um, donate it to anyone, then the owner still just keeps it and has potentially the ability to. Well, the, the, the only so if, if, if we end up not finding any takers right. one way or the other, it will still be classified as it is today by Fairfax County as RPA. And there are some exceptions to building within the RPA. Mm -hmm. Most of those are are benefit more like an individual homeowner who wants to put like a retaining wall or part of a gazebo, you know, minor little stuff in the RPA. As a general matter, it's pretty difficult for a commercial developer to do anything. So uh, even if it's in I three, it doesn't matter. Correct. It doesn't matter if it's I three. If it's in the RPA, that's why our staff has been, again, so insistent that we we not do anything in the RPA, even if it would make it a little bit easier for us to like encroach in little bitty places here. Yes, sir. In the back. The 67 acres is also designated floodplain. Correct. Correct. So correct. Is there even any business model you would have when you could terraform a floodplain? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Is there anything you could see yourself doing to terraform a floodplain into a buildable space? It's basically not buildable, right? It would, yeah, it, I mean, maybe, maybe it's theoretically possible, but Fairfax County in the foreseeable future would Neither Fairfax nor Virginia or any kind of public policy would want us to do the kind of work it would take to make it potentially developable, be up above the floodplain. It would have you know, negative environmental impacts that nobody, you know, that all state, local, federal policy would all uh, you know, be, be against. Which we have no interest in that. And there actually will still continue to be a 10 foot easement that allows for a public rail system to continue from the parklands that exist closer to your properties. To continue through ours to complete the trail now. Oh, yeah. Thank you. That, that, that's a good uh, uh, reminder for me that of, of the 67 acres with the existing approval for the car dealership, one thing the county asked for and the prior applicant gave was a commitment to put a, a you know, a, a, a trail for you guys and other residents of Fairfax County to, to use. So 
you know, you can you can walk the dog or, or yeah, the trail. Right. not install the trail, dedicate 10 feet of area within our property to allow the county to build their own trail if they chose to. If not, the public would have access to it. It just wouldn't be an approved trail. It would be basically a not Yeah, trail. an easement for a trail. I'm sure there are trails sinking all through it as it is, but, but that's something the county got with the last approval and that we're carrying forward with this approval, again, to the extent the county uh, wants that. Yes, ma'am. Two questions going back to the sound. Um, what is, is there any type of proposal for mitigation? Is there any into the building site now? What are they proposing to mitigate the sound? And once the data center could be built, if the sound does reach um, the, or goes over the sound ordinance, is there any plan to mitigate afterwards? So we are going to have to agree to. Uh, so as Jamie mentioned, there are Fairfax County regulations about just how how loud um, uh, a use can be in general. Right now, with the noise study we provided, that in, including the the slides we've shown, it's it's demonstrating that the, even when the generators are running, it's still going to be quote within acceptable sound limits. Um, so, but the other thing the county is requiring us to do is you. you you have to, we have to design the building so that the noise isn't so great that it exceeds certain levels within our, our own building. So what I'm talking about is that if we build a data center, of course, there's going to be a few people at least working there. There's going to be parts where parts of the building where you're not going to have um, servers. We're going to have to, we are going to have to commit to a proffer that says, we will do testing before and after, and we'll demonstrate that in those non server portions of the data center, the noise doesn't exceed 50 decibels, um, 50 decibels. And that necessarily, like having to meet that standard, is going to mean we're going to have to buffer the coolers and the generators to some extent to keep the noise and building that low. That's going to have a benefit for the surrounding area to, to in terms of like keeping the noise levels down. I guess what I'm asking is, is do they have to be in, in an enclosed structure or are you planning on doing any type of dampening of the that, coolers? Uh, yeah, Jamie, do you miss the sound model takes into account dampening um, effects and mitigation efforts for the reduce the sound down so we're not causing negative impacts to anyone adjacent to this. And then once the, the building is approved and it's built finally, and let's say for some reason it, it's exceeding what you calculated in your um, you know, proposal, and it reaches 60 decibels in the middle of the night continuously. Is there any plan to mitigate further afterwards? So, yeah. Well, well, I would just say what, what would happen in that scenario is if in years from now, if, if we get this project approved and data center gets built, um, zoning code enforcement would, would be able to respond to those calls and they could come out and they could they can make life very uncomfortable for the data center user um, under the under the conditions of approval. If we're exceeding those standards, um, they could they could uh, yeah, they could, they could, us. They could shut down or give you. I think I think just to answer your question too is that one of the the things about uh, Fairfax County is the noise ordinance is a complaint based system. Um, it is not really designed to uh, prevent. The noise is designed to, if there is a problem, zoning will come out and say, hey, call up Amazon, can you keep it down? Um, there's really not any real uh, way for the county to enforce it for these data centers. So it will be a complaint-based system. And the problem with the ordinance also is it doesn't really handle continuous and that's the concern I think people are having is that it's a continuous noise. So how will that, you know, if we can, it will be much more cost effective for you to mitigate that prior to building rather than to do it after. I mean, there's things like the, you know, the liquid immersion pooling that maybe you can use instead, which would help keep that noise down. So that's just, I think, what people's concerns are is. Why do we have to wait till afterwards when it becomes a problem when we really can't do anything about it? And just to piggyback on that, is there anything that the county can do to incentivize the applicant to uh, do those things 
and Fairfax County somehow subsidizes um, the higher cost? The short answer to that, well, yes, but no. Yes, on the first part of that question. Um, you know, Fairfax, since we are asking for special exceptions to build a bigger than normally allowed data center, even in I-5, and, 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 you know, height greater than is normally allowed even in I-5, they can, they, they can and they will impose development conditions on our special exception uses, and we would have to abide by those. And as, you know, to, to Cynthia's point about, you know, screaming into the void to Amazon to turn it down. I, I know that wouldn't be effective, but I can tell you from experience uh, on behalf of my clients, like Jamie was saying, they can and they will shut you down if you're if you're violating uh, you know conditions like that and imposed on you for, for noise uh, regulations. They will take you to Fairfax Circuit Court and the judge will make life very financially painful. Um, for the, for the user, and that can include up to including an injunction, like you know, put a padlock on this. So then the applicant doesn't want, under any circumstance, to um, use sound mitigating uh, technologies. We'll we'll get back to we'll well. Is this it? We already have. Yeah, we, we are. If it's not sufficient, mm -hmm. obviously we can build on to that. But we've already engineered enough of these buildings. We've taken so many steps with all of these sound studies we've done. To predetermine this issue before it becomes one, but obviously, if something were to happen, we build a building and there's still a violation being created through the design, we would have to come up with a, 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 a way to continue to engineer any better system that's already in place. And, and can I just be clear when you say violation? Again, our noise ordinance isn't really designed to deal with continuous noise. It's designed to deal with loud noise that happens like at a party or what have you, barking dogs, the, those kind of things. It doesn't deal with continuous noise. So even though the continuous noise may be under the decibel level uh, indicated by the, the noise ordinance, it still can be incredibly annoying to humans. Yeah. So, um, so the zoning people's okay. hands are tied in that instance because if you're not going above the decibel levels that the zoning ordinance says, then there's nothing they can do about it, even though that continuous noise will be driving people mad. Right. right. But but again, the best the best forecasting we're doing based on the the, 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 the ways these things get constructed and you can tell, you know, uh, Jamie knows a lot more about this than I ever will, but the, the, the sound analysis we've done now is that under normal circumstances, that constant background hum of the air, you know, the air handlers on the roof, you know, those those shouldn't move the need. I mean, that shouldn't move the needle in your neighborhood. That's that's what our analysis it shows. Clear, it is a high pitched hum, right? A constant high pitched hum. Yes. <laughs> Measured in DBA. No, I mean, you're shaking your head. You're welcome. We can take this offline. Construction through the forest. I mean, I do things through the forest and blasting on the other side of the zebra. God only knows. Yep. So I can only assume that 4.5 miles away, right through the forest, when there's no foliage coverage in the winter, I would hear boom and cranes and this and that. that well, okay. There's so, so construct. Humming. Well, what's it about there? The construction it's constant. Okay, the, the constant humming will be there. I, I don't know what to tell you, sir, other than our analysis shows you won't hear that hum over in your neighborhood. I, I can't do any better than that. I mean, that's. Can I ask your analysis of the Fairfax County people? Is there any way that you yeah, can. It, um, it, that, that, that that's, be, you're confusing sorry. lines of sight with, with noise yeah. sets. Wait, wait, maybe no. we should let him continue because there are some other things that we do need that's to talk about, like electricity. Yeah. So please continue. Uh, I was just going to say you raised a good point about construction noise. That's totally different uh, from some guy here. Uh, there's, there will be noise associated with. Um, construction um, that you know that's a fact of life. The good news is is there we're not building any underground structures, including parking. A lot of the worst um, construction noises that people tend to complain about are from pile driving and from excavation work that's done for that type of work. This is going to be an above grade uh, structure, so you're not going to have any of that pile driving. Yes, ma'am. So you're not building any substations all for electricity. All electricity is going to be underground. 
the, the we, we will need power from Dominion. Um, Dominion will ultimately have to build a substation. Um, we, we don't have an answer on exactly where uh, Dominion is going to is going to build that substation. There will That's be no part. substation on site. There will be no overhead power lines on site coming through the RP yeah. and our site. Typically, when they come off of 50, they're underground by the point they get to their last you know file location. Um, let me ask that then, because in Loudoun County, as you know, they have that big uh, transmission line uh, fight, if you will, um, and they did finally build them through on 50, and they have the enormous poles. They're like 130 feet or something tall that have the uh, 230 kV electrical transmission lines, um, and they needed a swath of area about 120 feet wide to to run those lines. So. Are you saying you won't need those? Lines? No, because those KVA lines are what comes from the original generation of power, which is from the power plant to the substation, and that's how they come in those high like voltage lines. Once they get to the substation, that power can step step down dramatically, and then be, be distributed more locally to more locations. And so at that point, they're coming on the typical street, you know, the power lines that you see along the side. Fifty two feet tall. Yeah, yeah. But, but, on the ground. But, such a big data center, your electricity requirements would dictate you need those. No. It would, it would, so the 230 lines go to the substation. As, as Josh said, the substation is going to be offsite. We're working with Dominion right now to make that. What would leave the substation would be 34 5 uh, KBA lines that run to our site. Okay. And actually, if you go a mile down from our site, there's a substation down there, and you can see the side of the river lines. That's on Old Lee and uh, Braddock Road. That's the Novak substation. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. But that's you have a large lines coming in, and then there's a small line that ties into the main center of the site. So large would be the smaller line coming out of the substation, and then as Josh said, it would go more than likely down around 50 and tie in right there on the north side of our site. Oh, so you're actually talking about the Loudoun County substation, not the Fairfax County substation. We, we're working with the menu to try and figure out which way we're coming from, but the menu would bring it one way. But either way, they would need the large poles to get to that substation, and you're saying them from that substation to you guys, they would not need these enormous poles or right of ways and big easements. Yes, but I would also add a caveat that substation is not just for, for us. So the menu is working on our for the full grid. So that substation would be supplying all the commercial properties around it, as well as our property. In other words, we don't we don't have any control over how many end users or Dominion may hold. Sometime in this future, Dominion will come in with Sully District joint land use and transportation committee for each of each of you and say this is what we're planning to do. For example, where the old EDS site off of Route 28 is, which is now S Drive. Uh, Amazon had by right the ability to put the warehouse data center. We heard that the power center, the distribution center. So we heard the tail that went at the door. The door got in, and we only could talk about the tail. In this case, we're also talking about the tail. Yes, sir. I would understand if you don't know the answer, but do you know where the other two data centers across the street are? They would they be part of the same substation, or are they? Because that's a lot of. They they have their own substation. Okay. How long would construction last? Typically, the exterior build out probably twelve to eighteen months, and then once it turns over to a typical tenant, they'll do their interior build out. It's all in turn on at that point. Mm -hmm. So. You know, site clearing will take several months, then you construct just the shell, do all the site improvements, put all the stormwater management, landscaping. It's a fairly quick project when you talk about the structure in general. Okay, so assuming I think it's approved, when would the construction start? We would need a tenant first. We would get the zoning approval. We would proceed with a site plan application and design the actual project based on a specific user. It's not as easy as an office building where you just build a spec building and then somebody just moves in. Every data center user has a very specific need. And so you don't expect it to be just typically design these and deliver them and then find a tenant. So you would have to find a tenant first at this point. We did not have to sign these with a tenant to proceed with a spec of the building. Gotcha. Do you have any perspective on this yet? No. We've, we've spoken to a couple of years, but we don't have a sign of these at this point. Yes, ma'am. Is your sound coming taken to account the time of the day? Yes. So we ran a, a night analysis and a day analysis. So I'm sure. 
to the planning requirements. Okay. okay, and the results that you presented are they? Uh, I don't. I don't think the night study is on there. Um, I, think that it, I don't think it's in there. But as a prerequisite for our rezoning application, the staff actually asked for a full one. We just took expert to them to their chewy document with a lot of information, a lot of pages. So we try to take the things that was pertinent for you guys to see here. But the county actually is validating all this stuff before they let us do it for the dollar dish. So they have a very lengthy document that I barely even understand what right is. But, um, yes, ma'am. So, are, do you own the land? So, yes, Josh. Josh. Josh owns the land. So, <laughs> so, so, Josh, when did you buy all of this land? We bought the property, I believe, August of 2020. So, okay. So this part about how 67 acres to be donated and if it's not buildable, you bought 79 acres knowing that? We we didn't really go through the rezoning process to fully understand what we could and couldn't do, but our intention was to always take what we knew could be developed, which was 12.1 acres. That's our proof or car leadership. So we knew there would be a path forward to develop a new, a different use in that same footprint, and we just never tried to exceed it and go beyond what we were comfortable doing, but also what we knew the county would do. And, and, and we're highlighting that potential dedication of the 67 acres, because for whatever reason, the applicant that went through the process to get the car dealership approved, they, they just didn't do anything with it. They did agree to, to put it, uh, to proffer to put a, a trail through it um, to grant a, an, an easement to the county for that, but they weren't in discussions to to dedicate it to the park authority or to subject it to a conservation easement. Okay, but Josh personally, the owner, is good with just leave. Um, so some guy comes by later, Josh, and says, "Listen, I actually may feel I can do something with this land, and I'd like to buy it from you." And I'm going to put up God knows what, but I'm going to do that. Um, are you going to be selling it to them? Or is this, when you say it's really going to be dedicated, is that a definite? Or is that as part of this proposal, it's going to be dedicated? Like at this point, you know, in this particular point in time, but you're not talking about. It's in the It's in the county rules say you can't build it in the so, so I mean, the occupant owner and Josh currently all have this deadheaded space. They know that he's interested in the toll which is used, and the rest, as you said, is going to give the park authority if they will take it. If not, it just remains unused. We'll give if you it to the house, and there was an RPA back in your house, that RPA remains. It's not, and you can't build it as opposed to, as uh, heaven said, you might be able to build it. It's multiple variants in the county, but it's an RPA. And that's it. It's not going to change. You know, maybe if the sun heats up and all the water disappears and it's no longer on hit, that's not our life. I guess I'm, I'm not clear whether the entire parcel is a research protection. So you thought that many years, as he did indicate, it's all the See the green outlined area? Yeah, I see, I see that. I'm just curious to know whether just you know, all of, it, no. of that green area is RPA because I'm, I'm not oh, clear all that it is. is. All, all of it is a research protection area. The entire 6.7. Six seven. Six six seven. Seven. And then, um, I'm thinking to buy 79 acres and I know only 67, knowing that only 13 of it you can actually use. It's, it's not it. paying the same price. Okay. Oh, awesome. <laughs> <That's the result. laughs> okay. Think about it. You need this capital, okay? Wait, you still pay taxes, okay. huh? No one values this land at all because, uh, to be candid, when we were trying to come up with an efficient site layout, because this is a really strange state shaped site that we can develop, as you saw, we have actually at one point put up the RTA by about a quarter of an acre, went to the fence, to a quarter of our fence. They said take it out and we would not lose that much. So we had to even take out that very, very minor encroachment. To respect what they ask us to do. Right, so let's move on. I want to yeah. finish. We brief. just got a couple. I've got lots of questions that an audience have asked, asked yeah. online, and I want to have them be able to ask questions. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, just a couple more things. One thing on this slide is again, what we're anticipating is um, also making a, a, a financial contribution to the Fairfax County Park Authority 
regardless of, of whether we dedicate the 67 acres or subject it to a conservation easement, we intend to proper to make a financial contribution to the park authority for general park improvements in the area. Um, that would be if we build the full 402,000 square foot data center, that would equate to about $108,000 contribution. If it's a smaller center, it would be uh, proportionately lower, but that that's another uh, uh, commitment we're making to the county. Um, we tentatively have a planning commission date uh, for the end of next month on June 28th. We're hoping, uh, but it is by no means guaranteed that we're going to the uh, board of supervisors at the end of July. And as I mentioned at the outset, in my experience, um, the, the joint Sully district council usually has come back um, for a second time again to answer any questions um, that we weren't able to, to answer tonight. Um, we'll work with uh, Mr. Parnes on on when that might be, but that would probably be sometime um, next month. We would do Sorry, that. Monday of June, June nineteenth. Yep. So that's likely when we would uh, come back to this point. So happy to answer any other questions we haven't gotten to, or if they're Who's online. The last time? Just oh yes, this is okay. the last time. Uh, more questions I have here, I have the audience online virtual. I have a series of questions, so I'm going to ask those questions on the start of the time and give you their comments and questions to see what we can address, okay? So, oh boy, a lot of questions. <laughs> a lot of chat, a lot of background noise. Okay, first, if the I3 allows for the data center and there isn't a specific demand for the I5, is there really a reason to consider returning this to I5? So, what do you get from the I5 if you don't get from the I5? Well, so the, the port one of the 12.1 acres, which is outside of the RPA that we can build in, neither of that is I3 today. Part of it is C8 and part of it's I5. The part of it that was C8 was actually zoned, it was rezoned from I3 to C8 in 2020 because that was what made sense for the car dealership portion. Um, so we would be asking to rezone it to be able to do a data center, which I don't believe you could do in C8. And I-5 is what we picked, one, because it matches the bottom half of the 12.1 acres. And as I mentioned, it also allows for more uh, height and density so for a data center. What size C-8, what size I-5? Um, so C-8 is the north half. It's roughly 5.42 acres. I-5 is the southern half of the 12.1, and that's... So you basically want to have it all the same, so you're going to build it differently in the parts. Okay. Correct. Good. Thank you. That was a question. I think I five allows the greater noise. Would you like to have that question answered? I five greater noise. Uh, I five doesn't have noise requirements, and the zone. Yeah, the noise requirements are independent of the. Yeah. Of okay. The zone. It's true. Okay. I five is not, but there's no mitigation for noise required in I five, and that's why I five is very attractive to data centers. Okay. So, like somebody else asks, would also like to know if there's any buffer. In the 0.45 mile between the proposed data center and the Pleasant Valley Creek community. Um, the buffer for the trees. The trees. So you can't actually build a buffer in the protected area. So here's no question. So. I'm asking the question, please. I have a few questions we're going to get to the point. Okay. Is there any floodplain or RPA disturbance or encroaching construction access or utilities or otherwise? No, the, the only encroachment of the RPA relates to the outfall for the pond. Any stormwater outfalls into the floodplain of RPA? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Has there been any and, but, but let me stress a lot less than than currently approved. We, we've we've taken it. We've been correct. Okay. Is there, I, I want to add one thing. So is, stormwater outfalls are allowed for access to the RPA. So that is an improved access into the RPA. Any okay, has there been any architect archaeological survey and there is any potential for Native American sites? So I believe the answer to that is no. And the reason why is that uh, Fairfax County designates areas that it believes have a high likelihood of, of having artifacts. They they designate those in the, the county comprehensive plan, and this happens to not be one of those areas where they say that out okay. needs to be. Any potential for endangered or threatened species in the Stream Valley, e.g. wood turtles, and has that been analyzed? That has not been analyzed, but 
since we're not going into the RPA, there you know there won't be any impact on it. Yeah. Any are the old sewage treatment plants on the eight sixty seven acres or off site? You know, it's there's a sewer line that runs on the west side of Cut Run. Um, the previous car dealership was actually going to go across and tie into that one. We are proposing not to do that. We're going to tie into the new line auto park service. Okay. Which is unproven uh, from the last application. I was very are there any, any diesel generators for backup power? You said yes. Is there any additional electrical infrastructure needed, such as the substation or transmission lines? And where is that? And you said there will be, but the Dominion will determine that. Correct. Okay. Here's another question. If the I 5 rezoning allows for more noise, we already have the airport noise, business park noise, blasting from the quarry, noise from the high school and the airport. We're not going to raise pollution too much. But you said the I 5 is. Well, no, independent of I 5, the, the noise analysis we did was what the generators, the coolers uh, were going to generate. And it's. it's okay. Next question. I would like to see the I 3 compared to the I 5 of this slide. Is there any cooling system water discharge from the data center into either the storm water or the sanitary sewer? Is there recycling of the water and are there any chemicals in it or any treatment before it's released? So you, you are not allowed to discharge um, cooling water into storm water at all. So everything goes back to the Sanitary Sewer Treatment Plant. Um, they are in the process of uh, a lot of our end users are recycling water. So they cycle it through three to four times before they discharge it. Um, and then when they do discharge it, they do have to meet all sanitary requirements. Um, so that means they can't just send industrial waste into the sewer. So they have to be treated on site to that. So just to clarify that, sorry. Um, so uh, the elevated levels of saline that are created by the evaporative cooling process, what happens to that? That's you know, that's saline in the water is not very helpful to like the stream and, and it doesn't uh, it doesn't go into the stream. So, so so what happens to that is no that water it? goes into no cooling water goes into stormwater. It all goes to the sewer treatment plant where it gets it like every every other sheet of water. Okay. And why is there vehicular access directly off a of Route 50 if that is worth depicting instead of through this waterfall? Okay, so I, I, again, we, we do have to provide access from both points. I'm not sure if that's solely for the fire access, but um, in, in general, Fairfax County wants you to have interparcel access and they want you to have access. So you're saying that if, you, if you were a warehouse, you direct the, tr the warehouse trucks to Route 50 and the regular worker bees in through the auto farm. Correct. Right. Okay. All right. So, have they communicated with the airport at the 110 foot height? And does the airport object to that height in that location? Will there be flashing lights on the roof? There, there, there are there are standards for when you have to do uh, an FAA study to make sure you're not a hazard to air navigation. I don't think we come. So we we are um, we've looked at it. We so there's a thing called the FAA notice criteria tool. Um, basically, if you look it up for any building, even if you're building a house, it says you need to file if you're within two miles of the airport. So we are going to file. We'll handle that at site plan um, once we actually finalize the final building height. Okay. Uh, to continue. That live from the ground up on TV, not from the upstairs windows. Point it out. Yeah. Okay. So when you come back next month, we want to see the elevated line from the highest price point. In principle. In principle. <laughs> <laughs> Based on a variety of environmental and atmospheric scenarios, we can even have glass from quantum. I don't know what this typical map can be considered as a reliable scenario. Okay. And you would be proposing this is not guaranteed that this is what will actually be. I'm sorry, repeat that last part. You are only proposing this, not guaranteeing that this is what it will actually be. Well, so so if the Board of Supervisors approves our request to rezone, they'll approve our, our general development plan. Um, you know, both options, both the data center and the warehouse. When will you decide A or B? I don't know when we'll uh, I don't know when we'll be in a position to decide whether it's A or B. That'll probably be some time from now. But I was gonna say that once Assuming we go to the board at the end of July and they approve our development plans, 
then we will have no choice but to either build that data center or build the warehouse until we go in, in less than until we went back to the board of supervisors and said new plan we want to do something else that would that would strike out the option to do the car dealership at that point okay. um, so, so we'll be set the point that is being considered here is you gave a timeline earlier but that timeline determines there's an old song from the 50s you gotta make up your mind and it was Mamas and Papas who sang that. Well, maybe John Sebastian. John Sebastian. Hmm. You can't go with a little sister. You got to go with the older sister and the little sister. You got to make up your mind. The follows through on this. I'm sure you're ready. Was that? Sure. Hey, I don't know. <laughs> so, my point being is once the county approves this, the board approves this, then the next step is for you to quit the room about. They choose A and B because you don't make your mind. You can't do either. Right, you're just paying taxes at that point. <laughs> but but hold on a second because um, if, if they can't make up their mind per se is what you were saying. The zoning, the rezoning is a separate. Piece. But he can re they can rezone, but then they may not get their special exception. So I don't I don't. They're gonna see they're that gonna those two separate. Go ahead. There's a two Please. separate pieces. Assuming they they approve this rezoning application, it's going to be tenant demand driven. If we find a data center user, we sign a lease, we will build this data center up to four hundred two thousand square feet. It may be smaller; it can be no bigger. Um, and as far as when we have to build it, by I don't believe there's a timeline on when we have to execute yeah, this. Yeah. Just like these guys got this data car dealership approved two years ago, so we could sit here for how long, Evan? Before well, so so the. There's a distinction between the, the resign and the special exceptions. Right. The special exceptions typically are for 30 months, three years, somewhere in that time frame. So what 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 often happens is if, if we have not done anything in that three year window, then if if Jock or whoever owns the property at that point still wishes to pursue a data center that's on that is the be four hundred two thousand square feet before that uh, SE expires. Um, we would either have to ask the board of supervisors to extend that period, or uh, and they would have to vote on that in a public hearing, or we would have to um, get a footing to grade permit, like have begun construction and, and started doing the work to like best that right. Or I think you can let it expire and then you can build or a you, seventy-five foot tall data center, which is that's about right. That's that, that's right. If okay. the, the SEs expire, so. Oh, so. Uh, here we go. Uh, okay. Is there a noise or an accessible standard of continuous 24 by 7 noise? Not right. Fairfax County. It's Not that yeah. Fairfax County. Okay. I'm worried about wildlife as well. This is just a nightmare for them. Are we going to be dealing with displaced animals moving into the neighborhood, which can become an issue for us? I, I I don't believe so. I don't. I that was six like, seven for RPM. RPM. I mean, we're not touching the vast majority of wooded areas. I mean, well, we, don't know that. we don't know that. Here, other things. Yeah, yeah. 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 I see on the other side. Yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, I'll, I'll, continuous noise, and we don't know how the animals are. Right. So, we want to some data set your warehouse zoning to I five. This creates an opportunity for future issues with developments. If the operation details of the data center are unknown, and there still be development conditions imposed with the diesel generators or water consumption or other direct impacts. Those could be imposed by the yes. Yeah. Okay, the answer is yes. Okay. Running generators during the work day does not account for telework as young children, vacuum, or their exerting parents, veterans and elderly that are vulnerable to unexpected noisy situations. Uh, a warehouse can, can Creates more traffic on Route 50. So what analysis has been done on the traffic impact? Okay. We, we just did that as compared to the. Okay. So if the CA car park has been approved, both cases they're going to have less traffic. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that's good. Okay. Uh, there are already warehouses by Costco between Costco and the Bullet. <laughs> that's true. Okay. That's safe. People walk along Route 50 every day to access public transit, exercise, or commute. And yes, by foot. I assume no median break for this side on Route 50. So, is the increase in traffic going to make U turns on Route 50? And does that conflict with the traffic in Pleasant Valley, Virginia, running, et cetera, 
Three writers that read the one fifth of East Side. No, we're we're not contemplating that. I've been asked okay. to. Big trucks making U turns on the Pleasant Valley Route 50 intersection. Okay. Preference doesn't mean it's going to be a fireman. Yes or no? Do they have an ingress, uh, and egress, and base, or easement for the motor bar? Access over Route 50 receives the great conference. You do have access under the uh, auto park, and that's basically where you want your orphanies and business to come. Correct. Okay. So, okay. the plan is to appease the car dealers at the expense of the residents. Agree with the concept. Yes, we already have discussed the needs being coming from the uh, car park here. Does the park authority want the street now? Are there any hazardous cleanup issues or environmental issues from the old sewage plant? Did the park authority refuse it several years ago because of all the problems? No, it, what we've discussed with the park authority is concern about some bamboo uh, growing on part of the property, and they would just want a general cleanup of the whole 67 acres. There's there's not been any you know contamination or uh, pollution sources identified. I didn't think it's the bamboo people, right? Okay. All right, never mind. Uh, the Department of Coke clients will inspect during the regular work hours. The noises at night, you are out of luck. Mm -hmm. That's true. Uh, that's true. Okay. What items are self-imposed versus actually legally required? What? I don't know how to answer that. Well, any profits that you make yeah. are self-imposed, but once they're written down, incorporated into the rezoning, they're legally binding. Correct. They okay. become part of the zone. So if they make this a comment in a rezoning issue, that's it. They're kind of responsible for it. Okay. What you said, I don't understand that. Okay. All right, make sure if I think the development conditions have to be anticipate the impacts of the data center, even if the operation details seem vague and undisclosed. If it isn't written down, they don't have to do it. Okay. Uh, let's go. Quality, quarry blast into the West data center, how many everywhere else? Huh? <laughs> Here will continue to collect the substation B. Are we all paying for as consumers or is the applicant paying for it? As they mentioned earlier, the minion service is more than one. Customer with a uh, substation, and we all pay. We all pay. Okay, I know that when we discussed the EDS site and the fact that Amazon was building a data set there, the Dominion Power then puts it in as part of a capital construction, and in Europe with Dominion Power, it's incorporated into that. Okay, all right. Does the applicant, okay, you have a power station, more initial dual traffic impact, more perpetual load. Sorry. Okay. Does the substation need an SC or is that going to be a buy right use? Uh, that's going to go through what's called the 2232 process, and that's a separate county public hearing. Uh, and is this Dominion versus Novak? Dominion. 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 Okay. Okay. But Dominion does supply no. Okay, so just quote for me. Mr. Pond seems to have answers to all this stuff, but regardless of how well spoken he might be, uh, he can only say what the company tells him. No, I tell you what I've heard in the past after 30 years of work, not what they're telling me. Okay, there's a difference. I, myself, Jim, and Steve have been at this at these type of meetings for 30 years. I'm not repeating only what I've heard from them, I'm telling you what I've heard from previous experiences. Okay, and that's why I encourage people to join our membership. Learn what happens so that you're not sitting here unexpectedly for one thing that you've seen this over the years. It gives you a better sense that in most cases things aren't as bad as they can be, but in some cases they're worse. You have to know what that is. That's reassuring. Okay. Just right. saying, you got to know. Okay, a recourse to a court case would be private business going up against the resources of a multi billion dollar company. But yet, four people overturned the county's Z bond at the state Supreme Court, right? Just this year. Yep. Yeah, so, just because there's only four people going against the big group doesn't mean that those four people, if they have a legal argument, can't win. The county lost that battle and had to redo it all over again. Okay? Even if the residents win, it drains the material and emotional resources of the private residents. Mm -hmm. Great point of the electrical power impact to the existing grid, in which residents already see a strain. 
more power requirements, increased strain, as well increased power generation requirements, greater reliance on fuel to provide that power, and greater potential for electrical service interruptions. Actually, the representative is Evan Pritchard from Cook Harbor. Understood agree that if the rezoning occurs, those zoning parameters are what stands. Not any attention from this conversation. Okay. Uh, can they commit to do something other than diesel generators? We are not going to bring in the air pollution standards. The DEQ had to advertise the various spices here already because we are projecting to exceed the air pollution standards with diesel generators for the data centers already built. Okay. They couldn't hear everybody speaking. Can renewable all right? So wait, did they answer that question? Can they answer that question? Okay. Can renewable energy generation be included in solar panels? No, no, no. The one about the diesel generator. Well, okay. Okay. Sure. Diesel generators, solar power, region reuse. What about uh, we'll say it's it's based on the end user. All end users are looking to try and eliminate generators because they can cause issues. Um, but I would say there's they're working on it. I haven't seen anything right now. So thank you. Okay, you know, folks, I'm going to make a big speech. The microphone's here. So you got to look up the A. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay, please identify the specific parameters of the iPhone zoning version of what is being proposed. Well, I5 is being proposed. So it's not correct. Have you addressed the additional air pollution from cutting trees? Um, I'm not. Every possible that's buildable in the county will most likely be built. When your single family houses were built on your property, they cut trees. And when I in my past my living shape to the highlands, they cut trees. So don't argue about cutting trees when they cut trees to build your property. Our property in Pleasant Valley was all real long. Okay, but <laughs> not all properties feel. My point being is, both many people live in developments where trees were cut to make the developments. I don't have any support for people who complain about cutting trees for future development when they cut trees in the past. Well, that's not here. That, that wasn't the question. But that's the question. Are they going to cut trees? And I'm saying that's a new point. Sorry, that's an editorial comment. What would prevent you from getting the rezoning and the SE and turning around and selling the property to another developer with a different data set to play? Well, if I apologize. Well, I'm sorry, Judge. I was just going to say that if, if we get the rezoning and the special exception approved, it does it does run with the land so it's not unique to josh's company he if, if they chose to could could sell to a different developer it does but they would be constrained by they would be subject to the same exactly. just like you do you went back in and removed the car park and came with this anybody who did not live like the Requirements established on the original rezoning and on the current rezoning would have to come back and do the process over again unless they comply with the, the proper rezoning that just happened. Okay. Anybody can change that. I they, think what Evan said earlier was correct, where if they let the special exception expire and they don't do anything, then yes, the, the property owner certainly has the right to build a data center at meeting the requirements but of the they iPhone. But go back and ask for another SE. No, they don't need another SE. You no, know, they might have expired. They can go back and request it again. Are they you can, but okay, they... That's my point. Okay, well, we can't keep cutting trees, but we'll have one left. All right, never mind. <laughs> After the resolving, if they build a <laughs> data center in I-5, don't all the development conditions evaporate. I'm sorry. <laughs> if, you have, if you have the rezoning and you build by a buy right data center in I five, don't all the development conditions of that work? Yes, if you if you were to do a buy right, but but again, in Fairfax County, once you have that generalized development plan approved, that that actually takes away your buy right. Okay, so what you going to change the general development plan? You lost the buy right. Correct. You have all right. Good enough. Then. Until I think change them. <laughs> Last time. Okay, so I'm at Bingo. That was it. All right. So we have now gone through everybody's comments.
given that in the audience, Peter Gowering, the chair, speaking in my in my uh, voice. All right. Are there any other questions? Am I asking them, please? Two points. Come up and speak into the microphone. Because people in the online have not been able to hear the people in the back of the room ask questions. So please. And we're going to send out a couple of more of these forms. Send them out. If you haven't signed the attendance forms, we ask that you do that. Send them out. Um, if you want to come up to starting over there, introduce yourself, where you live, who you are. Turn the lights. So, um, lights, lights, lights. So, um, as uh, many of you know, I'm Cynthia Tang, and um, we do have a we do have a website, um, sites.google.com slash you slash save PV. So please visit that. I will be updating with information about what's going on tonight and any other additional questions you may have. Um, you can certainly contact me, jot this down, Cynthia at the shangs.com. That's C-Y-N-T-H-I-A at the shangs, T-H-E-S-H-A-N-G-S dot com. And I'll be happy to relay questions to Evan, uh, to Josh, to, uh, you know, all the others here. Um, so uh, what I would like to suggest, too, is that it, please monitor the website. I will see if we can organize a community meeting of our own so that we can come up with other questions, additional questions for the next time we get to uh, meet with Evan and Josh and, and uh, everyone else. Um, so please, again, just visit the website. If you can't find it, I'm on next door as well. Um, just look me up. Okay? okay. Thanks. There was a request by Andrew Watson right, to make his presentation. So. And I, I don't need the presentation. You don't anymore. I'm going to off the cuff. Okay, good enough. Then. So I'm going to stop sharing. One second, please. All right, so I'm not computer and I'm sharing so that people will be able to see you in this camera. But you're not helping them. What? Oh, come on now, guy. Okay, so stop. And I'm going to. All right, so here is the speaker. He's going to speak. And you have it. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, Andrew Watson, I'm your neighbor, community member. I'm the guy with long hair plays classical guitar, three houses down from the pool. <laughs> it's my backyard that was in the line of sight shot. It is my backyard, right? We all know NIMBY is a term, not in my backyard. This is my backyard. It just so happens I build data centers for a living. Oh. <laughs> I'm in. Loudon, Ashburn, every day with all the major developers and data center providers. Um, I want to make myself available. If you ever see me outside mowing my zoysia lawn that's brown half of the year, and then very, very <laughs> for the rest, ask me anything, AMA, as they say. I, I, I'm here to try to help us all better be educated about data centers. I just want to make a few points about data centers. Um, as I was personally very taken aback by the flyers and the things that were distributed in the neighborhood. Uh, and that's why I'm, I'm bagging my presentation because it was kind of, it was very snarky and I don't want to do that. I want to actually try to be positive and, and productive here. And if it sounds cheesy, I, I think it's real. Our data center industry is kind of what was one of the glues that kept together the fabric of our society during the COVID shutdown. Every single aspect of our culture basically turned digitized. It's all hosted in every data center that nobody wants in their backyard, but we need. Telemedicine, financial transactions, school virtual learning, Amazon, every social media site, all of your DoorDash deliveries, everything is hosted on a server. And 70% of global internet traffic goes through Northern Virginia, seven, zero. <laughs> Why these things you hear about the strains on the power grid, air emissions levels for it. But as somebody who does this for a living, managing schedule and budget, data center developments, and not, not for a developer here, I have no contractual relationships with them at all. By right does not mean they get to do whatever, and it never would. Everything has to be permitted, it needs approvals, it has to be authorized. Every statute and regulation that applies legally is made, it's made sure that there's compliance. And what I've seen with the presentation they've shown here has changed the many things that I think some of us came into this room with thinking. The RPA stays intact. 
That floodplain is undevelopable. There's going to be one building. It's going to be three stories, which is nominally 100 feet the way we build data centers. It's like 25 feet plus or minus floor to floor. It's not a huge, looming, multi million square foot structure that's going to tower over our community. Line of sight's important. The noise studies are important. I'm trying to make myself available to Fairfax County to help with some of the workshops that they proposed with the ZMOD for it. Okay, I, I want our voices to be heard both community level, but also this is what I do for a living. I will gladly answer any of y'all's questions back when we're across the woods here for it, but I certainly would answer one if you have. So, um, why do you think that we it requires an I-5 as opposed to an I-3? There's a height restriction. Right, and and and, I know Mr. and it, what's what's the it's the business so model? It's one the business floor, model. basically one one floor of the data center is higher than the seventy feet requirement. Data centers are typically built at twenty to twenty five feet per story of it, and then you have if you have rooftops, you have equipment for it. Loudon only recently went to three story structures, which is that approaching that 85 plus feet tall uh -huh. for it. Um, they used to be two story before that. They were single story before that. It's grown in density inside the data centers as all of our usage has increased. The CEO of Zoom put it best during COVID when people were getting angry at him. He was like, six months ago, we had a couple million users. We have 1 billion users right now. Our utilization rates skyrocketed as a culture. So the density inside data centers has increased. More computing in more building going higher that uses more power, that needs more cooling. There's a business model to make the construction and that infrastructure profitable. It has to be at the end of the day something that can be justified to be built. This is serious money to build and construct and then to operate. Um, and I think, I, Andrew, you, I think you agree with us that, of course, that if, if there's any chance for us to put in a proper or, to, or put in uh, some a, a request to mitigate noise up front before Absolutely. any of this happens, that that's the right way to go. Right. So that's why, of course, we're all here trying to learn and understand. There, there's things can be done. So, so rooftop air cooled chillers yeah. are, are a They've been in place for a while, but they're not the old school style of water cooling towers that ran chilled water piping systems. So it's, it's a different type of cooling, right? And they have these fans that create these noise and this hum, this low vibrational frequency for it. Amazon did no one favors on that Gainesville campus, but they didn't build 0.45 miles away from a neighborhood. They built like right on the other side of a neighborhood. And that's the bad press. That's that Washington Post story. That when I read it, I was like, oh my God, people, like, they should, no one should have ever let that happen many steps in between. Right. This is not that. Right. So it's and not. I'm up against the tree. Line. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, like, yeah. But it's not unreasonable for us to ask for those mitigations, though. It, of course, it's so. not. I, I, well, I'm not going to speak to what Ken or Ann is on, on it, but I mean, I would ask that in, uh, there's things that can be done with the, the way the rooftop penthouses are constructed. Generators are all in enclosures that are sealed in gaskets, have gasketing on them. Generators are actually far less noisy than the rooftop chillers. But actually, the generators don't need to be enclosed in the I-5. They do in the I-5. Generators themselves, diesel or HVO is another fuel, hydrogenated vegetable oil. It's the, it's the bio alternative. It sucks, too. Okay. The, they have to be in enclosures. They, uh, okay. The generator engines themselves have a waterproof enclosure around it that then radiates hot discharge air, hot exhaust air, and it, if emissions require it, they go through air scrubbing systems for it, and all of it's under a legal permit that's obtained by VDEC or through VDEC, the, the DEQ folks. Yeah, I'll add one thing to that. So, as I said, so uh, on the I'm Jamie Cox, the civil engineer, and as he said, so the generators are uh, in enclosures. So if, if you so we all dress, <laughs> so when there's square boxes right beside the big building, those square boxes are enclosures, and the generators are inside that. Um, one thing I should have clarified earlier: so the biweekly testing 
sometimes it's done with the door open, sometimes it's done, done with the door closed. So they kind of they try and mitigate everything they do. So every end user is working towards trying to lower down those noise levels. Most of them, so as I said, we have noise requirements that each county sets. Most of them don't want to meet it, they want to exceed it. So a lot of them are going for three to four to five decibels below those requirements. And so they are all working towards trying to lower that noise machine here. You had a question all the way in the back. That's my daughter's. Please come forward. I don't think your voice will carry. She's just being busy. How long does it take to build this data center and how do you build it? I'll only answer the first part as it was mostly described earlier. The big box itself is usually plus or minus 10 months. The site work can take in tandem three months plus or minus. Bidding out the inside of a data center could take upwards of six plus months. It all depends on how many changes the tenant wants to do. That's nominally, I drive as a push at schedule, so there's not. It, it takes a long okay. time, a year and a half plus or minus. Do you know anything about the liquid immersion cooling? Liquid immersion cooling is new to the market for the scale that's being proposed. The only people who have tried to implement it thus far is Meta, and it's really only been implemented. And I think they've just talked about it. They, no one's actually fully deployed it, to my knowledge, here in Northern Virginia anyway. Um, it's not, I would consider, an alternative right now, and essentially you have to continuously fill a huge garden hose around your building. It's, it's an active heat exchanger by using liquid immersion cooling for it. Thank you. What it offers is a greater power cooling density, so you can shove more servers inside a smaller space, yeah. but then that strains the electrical power. Okay. <laughs> Did your question get answered? Okay. So. Let me point out, when I was a scout, there was a citizenship in the community, merit badge. Any scouts here? Oh, no, 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 no. You're alumni. Okay? I, wait, now, on the other hand, once an Eagle Scout, always an Eagle Scout. Just like, right? So, but a life scout doesn't have that qualification. Okay, so in any case, nothing. We can help with that. We have certified other scouts and signed off to say that they're here. We've had Girl Scouts participate. You a brownie? No, she's in Scouts BSA. It's not no way. Oh, well, well, yeah, but there's still. My daughter was a gold awardee in Girl Scouts. She is in. Scouts. Okay. So, in, in any case, that's again <laughs> beside the point. So, okay. want to go here. Okay. Where, where, do you, where do you want me to stand? I'm just tired. about where these two people are. Okay. All right. Oh. See now you're you're on the screen. Okay, so so here's my question. No, 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 no. <laughs> okay, 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 okay. Uh, Stage direction. Sorry. Okay, thank you. Stage direction. Okay. Um, so so I have a question that you know you you and your particular job might be able to handle. I actually work for a company that everything we have is on AWS. So I'm not opposed to data centers in general. The question is where and when and how. Now. You know, when I've never been in a data center before, but I get a picture of row after row of hard drives or computer chips. <laughs> My question has to do with the technology five years from now. What are they going to be running? Is it going to be even noisier than what we have right now because it's running faster or it's bigger or whatever it is? What is it going to look like five years from now? Is it going to be noisier five years from now? Can't be. The little restriction that is signed. They but can't that's, be changed. That's five years down the road. But my point being is if that list says you cannot exceed X, doesn't make it the technology's noisier. You still can't exceed X. See what my point being? Whatever happens five years from now has to comply with the stage. I, I, I understand that. And, and if everything went well, then that noise would be corrected as it moves along. But my, my question is not, is that going to happen? My question is, Technology wise, is the technology going to be louder in the future? Not but never mind, never mind what, what what we do about it. Is the technology going to be louder in the future? I would assume no on the noise side. Okay. The the way we have been advancing with all of our technologies is the opposite trend. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. 
Any other persons like to come up here? Okay. First of all, Evelyn, could you stand up? Evelyn Spain is the Sully District Planning Commissioner. We appreciate she being here tonight and hearing your speak, your voices, your questions. She will be the person on the Planning Commission who will have to advocate for this and so. We'll come over here. Don't ask her a question. She can't answer your question. This is not the public hearing. This is not the Planning Commission. This is us that is talking. She's here as a listener. So you don't ask her a planning commission question. This is not the planning commission. Okay. Well, okay. Um, I'm gonna go sit down. Okay. Is yeah, there thank you. Thank you. I won't ask her then. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. No, but no. Over here. I'm sorry that I have to stage out of this, but I want the people online to be able to hear what we're talking about. Okay. So now stop. You're you're on the camera now. Don't go too far. Okay. Thank you. Introduce so, yourself. Who are you? Jeff Grayson, Pleasant Valley. Um, I um, would like to know, and I'm trying to ask it different ways, but is there anything that the county can do to make it possible to um, anticipate noise um, uh, pollution? Um, is there, are there tax credits? Are there other kinds of um, Permits that would permit, and I'm asking Fairfax County or the applicant who um, can try to negotiate that because I think if we did that, um, the problem would pretty much go away. Poonam is on online. Uh, she works with the zoning division. I don't know if she can answer that. Well, well, I'm going to ask try. the lawyer who's being paid to try to get your money. Can they answer that? I'll try to answer that. The, the uh, yes, Poonam, Poonam works in uh, Supervisor Kathy Smith's office. She's her who's aide, so she's she's sort of the supervisor and, and works with uh, Miss Spain as well, Commissioner Spain, um, as the eyes and ears of the uh, of the supervisor's office when it comes to land use applications such as this. Um, the, there is a planner at Fairfax County. I think she's on the uh, the line. She probably doesn't mind me dropping her name because it's public record. She's the point person for Fairfax County. Which, which um, is Emma. Emma Emma Estes, which um, with Department of Planning and Development. Um, and I, I know. Yeah. Turn your camera on. There she. Wave at us. I'm color. Emma, that's it. That she's waving. Right. <laughs> Wait. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I can uh, sort of speak to this um, I mean, the applicants noise study, which the county requires them to do um, and they've done at this point in the zoning process. It anticipates the noise impacts ahead of time to ensure that um, they demonstrate that they are going to meet the zoning ordinance at the property line. Um, obviously, the applicant has some more work to do based on this conversation and has to provide more information. <laughs> Uh, we lost you. We can't hear you. Oh. Stop, stop. You, we lost your voice. Can you hear me now? She can't hear Louder. you. For whatever reason, you're not on camera. No, she's not. She's not okay. Yeah, I know, but if you're trying to signal her, I can, we can't hear you. Say, uh, I'm going to turn this louder. Hold on. That was good. Sorry. Okay, try it again. Oh. Can you hear me now? We can hear you now. You can hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Great. I apologize. I'm not sure what's happening on my side. Um, the applicant is required to do a noise study, which they have done um, with a use like this that obviously has noise impacts. Um, and that noise study anticipates the noise impacts ahead of time and determines whether or not they are going to meet the noise ordinance. Um, however, uh, you know, the applicant has work to do clearly based on the more analysis and tell us how you're still breaking up. Yeah, we don't know whether it's the Wi-Fi in this room yeah. or the Wi-Fi with the she is. I assume it's the Wi-Fi in this room. Okay. Okay, Emma, thank you. We can't hear you anymore. It's, you dropped out. Nothing on your fault. Okay. 
I have one more question in that, um, and, and this is uh, for oh. everybody, Christine Andrews. Um, so the, uh, the, the USDA soil report um, that you guys had uh, done, um, it says it's uh, in a somewhat limited or very limited uh, for structures that are small commercial buildings that are less than three stories high. And when I asked the USDA uh, NCRS what that meant, and they said three stories for a small commercial building checks in at about 40 feet tall. So if it's very limited, which indicates the soil has one or more features that are unfavorable for the specified use, and the limitations generally cannot be overcome without major soil reclamation, um, how do you then justify going even three, almost three times taller than what they were already saying is no good for that? If ever there were a civil engineering question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, and I, I, I'm a civil engineer, not a structural engineer, so I don't do much in the foundations, but I will say, so um, that is something that we will figure out in site plan. Um, we know that we cannot do uh, any crazy foundations or anything like that, as Evan said earlier. We're not digging down deep to put in 60 feet, found it, 60 feet piling to put in foundations. So um, once we get the site plan, we'll sit in there and figure out a strategy. If, it, if we have to do the soil reclamation, then we'll come in and um, do some cement treated soils uh, to try and get um, the level that we need to build the building. Uh, so I think it's going to be it. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, oh, go ahead, Steve. <laughs> okay, great. Right. Yay. Okay, uh, Stephen Schuler with Western uh, with uh, Virginia Chase. I do uh, I understand that uh, that Dominion will pay for the for the power station because there are multiple consumers. I'm curious. Do you have any idea what for what portion? What percentage of the power will be consumed by the by, by, by the base? Um, so that that's what we're working with Dominion right now. So ultimately, what Dominion's doing is trying to find an area to build the substation. And so, once Dominion finds an area to build the substation, depending on how big that is, then they will determine how many people they can uh, accommodate with that. So. Um, in terms of sizes, you have any anywhere from an acre to 10 acre substations. The 10 acre substations supply 300 megawatts, which are, I mean, can power the entire city. Um, but the smaller substations, which will probably be, are more in the 50, 7,500 megawatts. Um, and I think our data center is around the 50 to 60 um, megawatts that we're looking at. Sure. So, so it's a pretty significant consumer. It, 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 it's a decent size. Yeah. Uh, I thought the Dominion had said that it was for 200,000 square feet was 65 megawatts. So, so you'd be over that. Uh, yeah, we go to the 402, you're probably looking closer to a separate market. Uh, do you have to ask, tell them a load supply? Do you have to send them a letter for a So, supply? based on whoever our end user is going to end up being, um, they will tell us how much load they need to supply the building, and we'll coordinate with Dominion and make sure that they are supplying them. And not all data centers use square footage the same, same way. Some try to put as many data halls in the middle of the scary as possible. Some of them actually have a lot more office space, which is more square footage, but isn't actually consuming a lot of power because it's more. Our employee friendly space um, depends on the end user and the technologies that we're ever involved. So, you saw on this schedule that they're going to be in front of the planning commission in late June. The Sully District Council and the Western Fairfax Joint Committee will meet the third Monday. We came to the conclusion it was 19 June. At that time, they will have answered many of the questions that they was raised today. And we will have another meeting. <laughs> okay. You're welcome to come back then. I have one more thing. Go ahead, Steve. Given that the that the public 
pays for it, we have it. Um, and given that the data is having to make it soon, is there a an opportunity for a program? Uh, right. I mean, just, uh, just to just to reduce and to, yeah, just to give some positive. So, so just to throw things into perspective, so solar panels on the data center roof would one. There's mechanical equipment on the roof, right. so it wouldn't the entire roof area. You'd have a little square area like you would see on a house, right. um, and so you're not going to get a lot of power out of that from the solar perspective. Um, but I, I know. Dominion is is working on ways to try and figure out how we can make sure that our power consumption is not just solely for the data center. Well, and to be fair, DEV is incentivized to build these substations because these users pay for electricity. If you can imagine how much a power bill is on a given month, they actually bill back the cost to build these through those end users. So in the end, it's built it's built into their agreement, their electrical service agreement, the ESA. And so ultimately, the data centers pay for the majority of the cost to build these things. And then they actually GED makes a lot of money off of it because then they're soon getting product. Buy off. stock. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. So I want to thank you for coming. There's a question back here. Introduce yourself. Stand right there. Matt Mazel, Pleasant Valley neighbor. Uh, I just wanted to clarify something real quick. I think I heard earlier when we were talking about the sight lines. Um, is it true? Did I understand that? Uh, the reading you did on the sideline was from 0.45 miles away to the nearest house. And then I believe someone in the audience asked about there are other points in the neighborhood where it's higher. And that was not taken into account. Right. Yet. And that that that's a good point. And that that's one thing we'll try to have for next time okay. is we'll get. Um, uh, I'm sorry, Cynthia. Cynthia sorry, no worries. Uh, we'll get with Cynthia. We'll agree on where the high high watermark is in the neighborhood, and we'll we'll try to create a, a, an exhibit that that goes from that high point. Right. Okay. Okay. That information on the website. Okay. Does that help you? That helps me. Then my question is basically that kind of seems like a glaring omission to me. So, kind of my point before was, if it's that big an omission from this testing about sight lines, how can we trust the data? With respect to the noise that you breach, I mean, if you're making that big of a miss on the sight lines with this noise study, is there a big miss in there somewhere? Well, I, I will I will say to that that they are done by different people. So you know, we did we did think that the you're correct. Maybe we made a misjudgment in thinking the people closest to the data center were going to be the most visually impacted. You know, so we'll fix that. It was a different, a totally different group. Um, yeah, you know, some are run by people that that's all they do every day is noise model, um, different sites. Um, they've got the latest information on all of the data center sound modeling. So what, what, um, so the fans that he was talking about, the generators, they know what they get all the requirements from the actual, uh, operators of those equipment and use that to model it. Um, and then all of the modeling software that they have is the latest software to use um, to model to model those sites. Did, did the sightline people that you hire do sightline studies every day? So the, the sightline pays off of a requirement from Fairfax County, and so it's basically just the closest point to you to your sites. So what we can do is we can do another sightline from the house that is eighty feet off the site. Yeah, they're Yes, the yeah. topography head goes up 80 more feet. Yeah. <laughs> so, and, and so we can do a sightline study from that. But the sightline, I do want to throw out the caveat that the sightline is not from the top of the house. The sightline is from where your average standing person is on that first floor of the house. And in this so sense, you're not from the top of the neighborhood. It's not from the top of the neighborhood. So we'll, we'll clean that. We just chose the limitation to start with. We could have done a sightline from five miles away where you might have be a, a mile up, you know, in grade and be able to see it as well. I'm not That's really true. concerned about the sight line. My point is more yeah, the correlation yeah. to the value of the noise study. Yeah. Right. And That's you really might as well take it because you don't even know who you're selling this to. So who's the data center going to be? How, how are you going to ensure that they need 
certain requirements that this noise study said. Well, it's, it's again, if it's in the office, it will be required. And it, it's not part of the proffers. There's nothing that says. That. Yeah. It just says they have to have these noise levels. And so my, I think it's on his, his you know, his, his point is well taken is the fact that you hired somebody to do a noise study, but they have no idea who, what data center is going to go in there. Can I, I speak to that is that we're very financially incented to make sure we, well, we don't know who that end user is going to be. These guys are talking to a lot of. Of, of people like Mr. Watson who know the business, because the last thing he wants to do is have gone through all this trouble and spent all this money and then find out, you know, that we've got a project to prove that, you know, is going to work for, you know, for the end user. So we're doing a lot of, a lot of it that stay together. And, um, and our tenant leases are beholden to our requirements or their requirements. They can't just go rogue and say, well, it's not our problem. It's your problem. It's ultimately they're going to be the end user is going to be impacted because they will potentially have these injunctions and it will go to court and then it will be painful for everybody. So we're not trying to do something that we know we're gonna have a problem with. The lady behind you. Yes, you do. And keep on going, keep on going. Turn around, introduce yourself. Wendy Musin, Pleasant Valley. And I apologize, we arrived late and it may have been look, covered. Look, look but covered too. When you're talking about lot lines, is it your property line or the data center's lot line that the noise is measured from? It's so measured from the point of generation, which is okay. a problem. So not the end of the RPA next to our neighborhood. Correct. Correct. So it goes from the generator. Okay. So those lines, and I believe this report, you guys can all access this report. It'll be on the, the county it's website. Um, in that report, you can see the lines go out and decrease in decibels as they go out. And so during normal operations, um, it was 50 decibels. We don't even reach the neighborhood. Oh, okay. During generator testing during the day, I think 55 decibels reaches the last house in the, in the thing, in the neighborhood. Um, and then there is, we do show a emergency situation. And that has lines in there showing that. Okay. okay. So when the Sully District Council or the Joint Land Use Committee hears the final presentation, we will say whether we have objections or concerns. We'll say usually that we have no objection to this going forward, but if the county and its staff report has objections, those are our objections. And then we ask them to come back. So if the county has objections, it doesn't go to the PC. It's squared away before the PC gets to it, and they'll come back a third or fourth or fifth or sixth time. We had some things that took 20 years. The companies went bankrupt, and a new company came in. Uh, if you know where the uh, little is, that used to be a Marlow site. Before it was a Costco site, before it was little. And that was in the 1990s. So things take a while, sometimes. Sometimes they go fast. But we who have been on this committee can remember back to some of the original presentations of how they changed. Okay, I think this will be not quite a 20 year. Yeah, no, I'm done. Go ahead. No, okay, no, you guys are Come back up. Okay. I guess just one thing that's lacking again is the noise ordinance does not handle continuous noise. And that's something that's. Then you need to tell that to the. Supervisor Smith and say, why not? Okay. She is responsible. She's the land use committee chair or the land use committee for the planning for the board of supervisors. Okay. So if that's a fault that you think, and we have a member of her staff here, right? Turn your turn your camera on. Yep, I'm here and I'm taking notes. See, she's taking notes and names. <laughs> okay, go ahead. All right, so I didn't did not introduce myself earlier. I'm Trevor Priorly from Pleasant Valley. I my my main concern with this, and there are other concerns, my main concern with this is the noise. And noise engineering is a complex thing that's not something that everybody understands. But we kind of have this sense that a lot of times you try and find out the minimum. You know, what's the minimum we can do to you know, meet the requirements that are given to us. We don't know what that minimum is. We don't know what you're doing. 
We are in a neighborhood where we've been very sensitive to noise. We live next to the airport. We live next to light industrial. <laughs> so I'd like to encourage you to think in terms of not doing the minimum. And thinking about the people who are going to be next to your data center, the noise that we're already facing, and do what you can to make sure that that data center, which we need, we need data centers. I'm not knocking data centers. We need them. I work for a company that uses them. But do what you can to make sure that that noise mitigation is something that our neighborhood can live next to in, in peace and without having to constantly be cursing the people who don't have that. So yeah. that's on. Okay, so let me give you an example. How many people here know where the old EDS property was off of Route 28? Okay. You know now that that's going to be a data set to Amazon. There are people on the Air and Space Museum Parkway on the west side of that parkway who have townhouses and uh, two over two houses. They back to that property. Okay. When EDS built it, it was I something, something, and they had buy right. The Amazon proposal was buy right. Think about those people who have a wire fence between their house and the Amazon site. Okay? There's no half mile of RPA between those houses, those houses back to those houses that are that site. Okay? And there's nothing they can do about it because it was a buy right industrial parcel. Which is why we don't want I-5. I understand, but you have a half a mile of RPA, is what I'm pointing out. As opposed to these people who have a thin inch yeah, offense. So recourse after you I have a recourse. Evelyn is sitting behind you. The recourse that you have is the laws of the county. And that's the only thing that you can do. I spent, Steve spent days and months testifying in front of the Planning Commission, the Board of Supervisors. When these public hearings are open, you have the right as an individual to speak for five minutes in front of the planning commission if there are 40 people here today five times 40 that's what 200 for 200 minutes of testimony when you get to the board of supervisors you have three minutes as an individual 150 minutes of testimony if you were a group you'd have 10 minutes and five okay again get a group Find one. Make yourself the unaffiliated Pleasant Valley homeowners group. Okay, bring it. Do it. Join us. Speak for it. That's all that we can ask that you can do. You cannot do more than what the law allows. Okay. Um, no, excuse me. People do what more than what the law allows, and they suffer the repercussions. Okay. Okay. My point is, you work in the system. Take advantage of the system. Within union, there's power. You can make your voices heard. You made your voices heard today. We will invite you back next month when you come back, right? Hopefully it won't take two hours and 15 minutes, but I think you've heard enough tonight to hopefully alleviate some of your concerns, yeah. okay? And I want to thank the man in the back who lives amongst you. Andrew. Andrew, okay. We want to thank Andrew for coming up and willing to speak the truth, okay? Truth to power. Truth to very much power, because we see how much juice they're going to take. All right. Then, uh, and, and thank you to you guys for showing up and answering our questions. Okay. So, the Sully District and the uh, Joint Sully District Land Use Transportation is now going to discuss the Route 28 bypass. We have a motion on the floor to pass a resolution. You're welcome to listen and help us and understand what's going on. There are many other things. We talked about a bull run post office to object to having trucks on that. In the past, we talked about the uh, many other resolutions. We try to be vibrant. We welcome you here. And guys and gals, thank you for coming. We're going to let you go. If you're leaving today, put your shares back against the wall. Okay. And now we will continue. Evan? Thank you. Okay. Okay. So. <laughs>
Has everybody saw it? You can leave to leave the pie, right, leave the rest of the chair for so, curiosity. Uh, Thank you very much. Okay, I told them at the very beginning, if you're disrespectful, We spend money on these two things. We're buying this, we're buying that, we're buying this. We have to pay the we have to buy the Webex uh, license. Yeah. Yeah. The post office box, the website. Yep. Yeah, I'll read. I get it. And a ten dollars a membership. So you need something like forty membership. Yeah, yeah. So that's a low cost, low barrier of entry. 
And yeah. You're running a different club, so I, I feel your pain. So. Gravy. Yeah. Gravy. 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 Yeah. Yep. That's why I want to say. I played this. There you go. There you go. He whispered. Yeah. He was very nice to meet you. Okay. Take right. care, everybody. All right. If you're going to stay, stay. If you're going to talk, talk. Out. I want to say thank you to you, sir. You seem very experienced and, and confident, and, and it's not just confident in how to run up things, but uh, yeah, you just made quick work of a lot of stuff. And, and I try very informative. And I really appreciate it. I, I tried to, I wanted you to be aware that this is not always the worst it can be, and that we've experienced worst cases, and that we know. Steve and I have been. How long have you been on this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you guys both. Thanks for the last 20, 30 years. You guys being here. Again, get somebody here. Get a group. Get a name on it. Yeah. Resurrect your own HOA. Or make it a citizens association. Greenbrier doesn't have an HOA because it predates HOAs and has a civic association. Not all members join because it's just it's voluntary. So just get a civic association as opposed to an HOA. HOA is a legal entity that has control of things. The civic association is just people who associate civically. We did have one. You can see in the name. So who takes care of the so who takes care of the common ground? Nobody. Nope. It's all voluntary. We go in, we pull weeds, um, we hire the landscape. What about your pools? The pool is run by somebody else. They and they can't get involved politically because they have people from Fairfax County on the board. Because it's been taken into receivership. Yes, yeah, so can't do it. Okay. <laughs> Chantilly Highlands, never where I live. All right, same idea. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you very much. So our pools all right. I'll, I'm going to send an email out and we'll do the other business by home. A continuation. All right. We're going to do it another day. Oh, well, I'm going to do it between now and then. I'll just send you an email about that. Okay. Okay. Let me see email address for that. You get the presentation also. Or not email. Go to sullydistrict.org. Sullydistrict.org. Look at today's agenda for the land use committee. Go down the agenda and there are links to everything. Uh, okay. See, I go down, keep going. And here's where keep it going. It says, here's the land use meeting. Look at the agenda. And then go down the agenda. That's it. Okay. My coding skills that each came out. They're not WordPress, nothing else. If I can type A href, I can make a list. Uh, okay, no problem. Thank you. Okay, ladies and gentlemen of the virtual world, we're going to continue our meeting by emails to those people who are on the Sully District land use and transportation email mail sir if you would like to be on those conversations send me an email at webmaster23 at sullydistrict.org you can find that information by going to the sullydistrict.org page looking at the bottom and seeing what the webmaster links are and follow that link with that in mind jim julian marianne and catherine thanks for joining us tonight have a good night thank you yep. Yeah, I I I I know. I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I